Amen. Amen. Happy Sabbath, church. This week we've got a number of good things happening. Uh, as you know, the Wednesday night out, uh, that continues on. Uh, we've got another week of that. So Wednesday nights. Um, and uh, as I understand it, the food just keeps getting better and better. So we invite you to come out at, uh, at 6 and have a meal and then join us for some classes afterwards at 7. That information is in your bulletin. It's, what, what was that? It's $2, I believe, for those who are wondering. Yes, $2. Uh, we have some membership transfers. If you want to look at that, uh, it's in your, the insert in your bulletin. Second reading, uh, coming to Carmichael, are Ted and Jeannie Mock. Are you guys here? And then Edmund and Amanda Corpo, Corpus. So if you see them, uh, we're going to be doing interviews with them, getting them uh, welcome here. So try to keep, your, keep an eye out. And also taking off from Carmichael, uh, Michael Lockwood, Christina Cyphers, and Frank Hightower. Now, I want to let you know, uh, with Frank Hightower, uh, he asked me to pass on that uh, he's really been blessed by this church, uh, and he, he's liked his time here. Um, he's moving his membership because he lives down there and has been asked to preach on occasion and help out with different areas of their church, so he felt like he should be a member down there. Uh, but his wife, Hosea, uh, is still blessing us with her presence. So Hosea is just, I was talking to her this morning, she just wanted to let you know, she has just been blessed so much by this church. Um, she's been a pastor's wife, and so she's had to move around quite a bit with her husband, and she said she's f glad to finally have a church where she can call home and just relax and just enjoy all the people who are here. So thank you for making her feel welcome. So can I have a motion to uh, accept these transfers? Second? All right. <laughs> thank you. Um, today we have a visitor's luncheon, um, and you'll also see uh, they were hosting uh, that the greeters are hosting today's luncheon, so we invite you to check that out afterwards. Uh, for those who are visiting, uh, it's a great time to get to know people in the church and just to kind of have the time to meet people, um, connect with friends. We invite you to join us for that after the service. Uh, CCK invites you to save the date, Saturday, November 1st, uh, for the Heroes Unmasked. Uh, I, I'm happy to announce that I'm going to be King David, uh, and you have many other people that are going to be uh, exciting Bible characters, and we want you to come check that out and be a part of that. Uh, bring your kids, and it's going to be a good time. Now, um, we also wanted to let you know that there's an exciting announcement for flowers today. Uh, these flowers are provided by the birthday twins of Mike Breckenridge and Dwayne Witzel. Um, they became aware that they had a twin in Carmichael, someone who was born on the same day they were. And so this is letting, them, letting you guys know of the joy that they've had from meeting people at Carmichael. So uh, that's the, the most uh, unique flower announcement I've ever made. And so I'm just, it brings joy to me to be able to explain that to you. <laughs> uh, finally, as you know, um, we've got the fall festival uh, coming up this Sunday, uh, Sunday, October 26th. Uh, from 10 a.m. to 2 p.m., and that's uh, it's great. Uh, it's good food, um, good games, so we invite you to mark that in your calendars as well. And finally, uh, I believe Lois, are you, are you here to talk about Bags of Love as well as Suzanne Dizon? Uh, if you guys would like to come up and uh, share about our exciting outreach opportunity happening next Sabbath. Happy Sabbath. Isn't it beautiful out today? I'm so glad it's Sabbath. Come on over, Lois. We are here to remind you this is the last Sabbath before we have our special um, community service day. So next Sabbath is Make a Difference Day nationally, and for this is the third year our church celebrates that by um, serving our community and the neighbors around us. And so in your bulletin today, you've got an orange half sheet of paper. If you want to take that out and follow with me, I just want to really quickly go over the different opportunities that we have for you to serve. And I will be out in the lobby behind, or after church, and if you can come and sign up, that was really helpful for us, okay? Um, so, at 10 o'clock, our schedule's gonna be a little bit different next week. At 10 a.m., we're gonna have a morning worship right here in the sanctuary, 
and then we will go off to our respective projects. Some of those will take place here, some of them will take place off-site. For those people who choose not to volunteer, there will be a special worship service at 11 o'clock in the youth chapel, and that will be led by Pastor Bui. And then at 12.30, we'll start our fellowship luncheon back here. Um, if your project runs longer, it's okay, because lunch is gonna run for a couple of hours. So, um, so here's what we've got in store. Um, we have, well, I will let actually Lois start out because we have bags of love, and I'm gonna have her tell you about that before I go on. <laughs> <laughs> Dangerous thing, handing this over to me. Okay, um, she's got this list of all these lovely things to do, which you don't know is on the back of that list, uh, on the back of that is a list of all of the goodies we put into bags of love. Some of you already know about this, but for those of you who don't, um, a lovely lady named Gwen Lee started a outreach ministry years ago um, to help foster children. What we do is we fit, make about pillowcase sized bags and we put into that bag a blankie, uh, bathroom stuff, toothbrush, toothpaste, washcloth, shampoo, lotion, uh, barrettes, brush, comb, all those sorts of things that a foster kid might not immediately have available to them when they um, leave the children's receiving home and go into a foster care situation. Um, I guess it, it, what started me in this is it just broke my heart when I read of a child being sent into foster care and they had like one or two small things and the only thing they had to carry it in was a garbage bag. And it just, it just stabbed my heart. I thought of all the things to do to a child to make them feel that way about their things. So that's how I got involved in this. I sew bags for Mary Lloyd here. Mary Lloyd and her friend Karen took over from Gwen when Gwen could no longer do it. Mary Lloyd and Karen do this on a weekly basis. They'll fill a couple bags at a time and take them over to the children's receiving home. What we're doing next Sabbath is we're doing a big bag filling bash and we will fill at least 60 bags for these foster kids. What I need your help with and what you can do, a couple things. One, you can look at the list. The items in bold are the things that we're short on. We're perennially short on shampoos, conditioners, lotions. You know, don't get the ginormous bottles, but buy a couple. Um, my email address is on that. If you buy something that you're gonna drop off early next Sabbath morning, just email me and let me know what you're bringing. Because by Friday afternoon, anything that I don't have enough of, I have to run out and buy, <laughs> okay? So let me know what you're getting. The second thing you can do if the Spirit's moving you to help with this and you can't, don't have a whole lot of kids stuff in your house, write a check to the church and just write bags of love on your little offering envelope in the pew. Um, and that money then I'll use on this next Friday to go buy whatever hasn't been donated yet. But that's what we do. We give these bags to foster children who don't have anything of their own. And they'll have a unique bag with bathroom stuff and toys and books. Something of their very own. With a note from us saying, this is from your family at Carmichael. We love you. And we hope that you'll pay this forward somewhere down the line. Anyway, thanks so much for your time. Thank you. And thank you. Thank you so much, Lois, and thank you, Mary, and, and thank you for your enthusiasm and commitment to this project. You can see that this will be a blessing to many of the children in our community who need it. We have other equally excited and enthusiastic leaders on the following projects. You may have already been contacted by some of them, um, but just to let you know who they are. So at church, um, there will be flower arrangements and then deliveries afterward to shut-ins, and that's led by Susie Wanke and Carrie. And then the youth will go out and do a harvest uh, at a field that a um, farmer allows us to harvest every year. And the proceeds, what we gather in um, produce from that field is donated then to the Sacramento Food Bank. And the lead on that is Benji, Pastor Benji. Um, there is a men's worship team for a local senior care center and leading on that are Robert Jackson and Art Garbutt. So thank you very much for sharing your talents there. Um, we have a cookie assembly and delivery. So what we've done in the past is everybody who's able to here brings in baked cookies, and we need lots of those. So if you're thinking of volunteering for a different project, we still ask you if, you're, if it's possible for you to bring baked cookies. You can bring them at Wednesday night out, or you can bring them on Sabbath morning. Then we have uh, Weaveworks donation sorting. 
Uh, women's empowerment, we need to spruce up a little couple rooms there. Um, Keith Anthony is leading the Pathfinder food drive, and Jolie Blood is leading the Gibbons Park cleanup, and our own Pastor Caleb is leading a Sacramento Children's Home cleanup too. So thank you in advance. You are all the early birds. I think this church will be doubly full by the time the service is over today. So I would just encourage you to whisper to your neighbor to pull this out and pick a, pick a project and bring somebody along with you, and we will be really excited to see you next Sabbath. Thank you. Thanks, Suzanne. Thanks, Suzanne. Thank you. Can someone tell me when the Pathfinder Club went to Colorado on a camporee? How many? That'd be at least 10 or 15. Well, that was the last time I called for an offering. And I haven't been asked since. That time we needed so many dollars and I said, well, we're going to pass the plate twice to get enough money. Well, some of the elders thought I was joking, and we did it, and I haven't asked for the offering since. <laughs> so if you look at your bulletin, it says we need $198,000 between now and the end of the year, but I'm not going to ask for the offering twice today. I'm going to tell you a quick story. New pastor comes to town, and many of you have heard this if you've been here 25 years ago, comes to town, and he goes out and visits all his parishioners, comes to this farm, and it's the most beautiful farm he has ever laid eyes on. I mean, there's not a weed, there's not a plant out of place, the fences are clean and white and whitewashed, the roofs are nice, it's just gorgeous. And the farmer's on his tractor and the crops look great. Pastor's waiting at the end of the fence and says, just I introduced himself, he says, George, God has certainly blessed you with a beautiful farm. And the farmer says, you know, Yes, he has, and I don't want to take a thing away from that blessing, but you should have seen this place when God had it by himself. <laughs> I don't think we have to worry about that at Carmichael. I don't think God has ever had this place by himself. In fact, proof of that is, had he had it by himself, the roof would have been leaking this past week. But he didn't. He had participation. And that's what I think being a member here is all about is helping God show the community what this place is. And we can do that. We've, how many years have we gone now by making budget? Five or six in a row? This year will be no exception because God knows we can carry the burden. And so today's the first, there's only 11 Sabbaths left to participate in helping God with this church. Amen. In the bulletin, you'll notice a connect card. For those of you who are visiting, we'd love to get your information, um, just be able to let you know what's going on here at Carmichael, uh, answer any questions you might have. And also for those of you uh, who are at the service, after the service, uh, realize God's prompting you to do something, we'd love to hear about it and just let you know. Um, there are some options there just to let, let us know how God's prompting you to respond. So we want to make that option to, available to you. All right, let's pray. Lord, we thank you. Uh, God, and now as we... Uh, just come into your gates with thanksgiving and praise. Uh, Lord, we're thank you, thankful for, that you are here. Uh, we just praise you for being a good God who we love to worship and that we have a church family um, that we enjoy getting together with. So, Father, we thank you for these blessings. And once again, we just pray that you would be here in our midst. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. King David in Psalms 145 declares this, I will exalt you, O oh my God, the King. I will praise your name forever and ever. Every day, every day I will praise you and extol your name forever and ever. For great is the Lord and most worthy of praise. His greatness no one can fathom. Please stand, church family, as we sing about how great is our God, a hymn medley with How Great Thou Art. Oh, see how 
the splendor of the king clothed in majesty let all the earth rejoice all the earth rejoice he wraps himself in light and darkness tries to hide and trembles at his voice and trembles at his Our scripture reading this morning is found in the book of Mark, chapter 2, 
verses 18 to 22. I'll be reading from the J.B. Phillips translation. The disciples of John and those of the Pharisees were feasting. They came and said to Jesus, why do those who follow John or the Pharisees keep feasts, but your disciples do nothing of the kind? Jesus told them, can you expect wedding guests to fast in the bridegroom's presence? Fasting is out of the question as long as they have the bridegroom with them but the day will come when the bridegroom will be taken away from them. That will be the time for them to fast. Nobody, he continued, sews a patch of unshrunken cloth onto an old coat. If he does, the new patch tears away from the old, and the old is worse than ever. And nobody puts new wine into old wineskins. If he does, the new wine bursts the skins, and wine is spilled, and the skins are ruined. No, new wine must go into new wineskins. Yeah. Hey. 
this time, our uh, children's story is going to be presented. So boys and girls, I'd like to invite you to stand up, walk around, and gather up that children's offering. Come on forward.
Happy Sabbath. Boys and girls, how are you this morning? Oh, man. How are you this morning? Excellent. Okay. I have a secret, which is no longer a secret. I like blueberry muffins. They are delicious. I have one right here. That, oh, that is good. I mean, look at it. It's huge. It's awesome. Take another bite. Oh, you know what I just got? A big, juicy blueberry. Delicious. One of my most favorite muffins in the whole world. But here's the thing. I don't know how to make them. So you know what I have to do? I have to get out the box. And on the back of the box, there's a recipe. Oh, thank goodness, because I would have no idea what to put in blueberry muffins. So I'm looking at the recipe, and I just follow it. And if I follow the steps that are listed on the recipe, I know that when the oven timer goes off, what's going to come out? A beautiful blueberry muffin. Should I take another bite? I'm telling you, so good. That's delicious. Okay, so the recipe tells me that I need some milk. Tells me I need some oil. Tells me that I need some eggs. Right? Somebody took the time to write down the recipe just right. So at the very end, I come out with what? Perfect blueberry muffin. So what if I decided that I don't want to follow the recipe? I'm going to make blueberry muffins my way. I see on the box, it tells me I need two eggs. Well, I don't feel like putting in two eggs today. I'm going to put in six eggs. What would happen if I put in six eggs? It would taste not the same. Would it look the same? Probably not. What if I decided today I am not going to put in any of the water or milk? I just don't feel like it. What will happen to my muffin? It would not be very good. It wouldn't turn out the same. You see, the recipe is there for a reason. If we follow the recipe step by step, what are we assured of? A delicious blueberry muffin. Do you know that somebody took the time to give us a recipe for life? Do you know who that is? That's Jesus. Absolutely right. And you know where you find that recipe for life? The Bible. Do you know that when you open your Bible every day and you read your Bible, it tells you step by step how to have a great recipe for your life. It tells you how to be friends with Jesus. And most importantly, it assures us that if we follow step by step, the very end, we get to have a home with God in heaven. Isn't that what you want? That's what I want. Okay, so I want you to have a prayer with me. So bow your heads, close your eyes. Dear Jesus, thank you for giving us the Bible and helping us to follow your recipe for life. We love you, Jesus. Amen. Okay, you can go back to your seats.
Church family, let us continue to praise God from the bottom of our heart with everything that we've got. God says very clearly in the scripture that I inhabit, I dwell in your praises. He is so good to us. Let us bless his heart this morning as we praise him. Mm. We're going to sing a few songs that are old choruses, and if you don't know them, you will learn them very quickly. Our first song is an echo song. You are worthy of my praise.
is such a wonderful discipline because it doesn't change the heart or the mind of God. It changes us. He speaks to us through melody, through words, through the recipe of God's Bible. As we come into our time of prayer, we're going to switch it up a little bit and sing an old hymn that we rarely sing but is one of my favorite hymns. And I want you to open up your hymnals in front of you to hymn number 574. And we're going to sing this powerful hymn and invite as we come to his throne, asking God to just let us walk with him, not only today, but 24-7. Heavenly Father, we're grateful to be here this morning. We've praised you. We've proclaimed your greatness. And we see it all around us. May we not miss the opportunity to claim who you are in our lives, to claim your promises and therefore be witnesses. Thank you so much for this Sabbath. We thank you for our prayer service, our service this morning so far, our opportunity to praise you as a group here for these songs, for this time of sharing. And we thank you so much that we are a group that is devoted to just that, your praise. Amen. May our lives be a, uh, a reflection of what you've done for us. Lord, we pray for our church body. 
We pray for our pastors. We pray for our ministries. And, and we hope that everyone will find opportunity in our upcoming community service day. Lord, we also pray for our members. We are grateful that our brother Otoniel is back with us after having surgery on his eye, that he is here worshiping with us, ministering. We are so grateful for that, Lord. We pray for Tom Osborne, whose surgery has gone well. We wish him and we pray for a speedy recovery. Amen. We also hold up our, our brother Clemone, yeah. our sister Irene Bond. Lord, they don't just need your care and your love. They need our love as well, not just our prayers. Thank you for our pastors and the ministry that they do for us here. We hold up them, their families, and we also hold up Pastor Keith today. May his word touch us, reach us, and impress us as you would have it. Guide us throughout the coming week, Lord. Help us to remember that we don't just minister at the end of the week to each other. We do so every day. Thank you for our families. We pray a blessing on all the students who are attending schools Amen. here and far away. Amen. We ask that you will be with us throughout the rest of this worship service. And in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Happy Sabbath, church. Carmichael, are you blessed? Amen, amen. I understand, listening to some of you, that there's quite a few of you who have been running, and I guess maybe uh, my ear's in tune with that because I've decided that I'm going to run too. And it's kind of a dangerous thing to say when there's a lot of uh, voting in the future. I want to be clear, I'm not running for office. Uh, I'm going to be running with some of you in the... Uh, in the uh, run coming up in December. I'm just curious, how many of you are, run, are running in the CIM? Would you please stand up? How many of you are running? Would you please stand? Wonderful, wonderful. Okay, okay. That means there's, Steve, I think you've been, you, have you been in every one of them? Wow, that, how many has that been? 32 coming this year. You've been in every one of them. Hallelujah. Wow, that's cool. That is wonderful. Wow, 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 wow. I don't know if you can pick him out in there, but he's in that crowd. I, that's, that's, that's the guarantee. Steve is in there. It, it's really a lot of fun if you've ever been involved in a run, whether it's a marathon or a short run. I know a, a number of us are not running the entire marathon. Some of us are running segments of it. One of the things I always look forward to in the run are the volunteers. These folks are absolutely tremendous because as you go along, you get thirsty. I usually look forward to those tables, finding out who's going to be handing you that little cup of water, who's going to be giving you the little packets of goo, and who are the people, these are some of my favorites, who are the people who are going to lie to you? These people are absolutely fantastic. Now, those of you who are running, you're laughing already because you know what I mean. These are the people, absolute strangers, you may never see them again, but when you're running along, they shout out, looking good. And then they usually follow up with, you're almost there. <laughs> but all the way along the line, they are voices of encouragement. They're giving you the cup of water, the Gatorade, and they're giving you words of encouragement. They could only do this as they are present. This is, this is one of the great things about the gospel story that is described, and I want to share it with you today from the gospel of Mark. It is that God is present. Now, I, I need to give you some context here. The gospel of Mark, many commentators have suggested the gospel of Mark is the very first gospel written. What is unique about it is that the gospel of Mark is not written by one of the disciples. 
So it's written by an individual who has had to gather the stories secondhand. He did not see them. He had to interview. Commentators also suggest to us that the Gospel of Mark is written at a very pivotal time in early church history. Mark, they suggest, is actually living in Rome at the time when he writes this gospel. He is writing sometime after Peter has died. And he's writing while Paul is in prison. So that's kind of the background of Mark's writing of his gospel story. What's so powerful and so important for the church to know right then and there, what's vital for them to understand while they're seeing so much pain, loss, confusion, they need a reminder that God is present with them. I really believe, and I'd like to suggest to you that that is one of the roles that we, the church, have to carry forward with us today, that we have been given a gift. We've been given a commission to let the world know that God is present and that we actually get we get to carry on the message that as God has walked with us, so God wants to walk with you. It's a very simple message. I want you to open up, if you happen to have your Bibles, you happen to have your phones, whatever it is, or your scriptures found, I want you to open up, have it ready, in Mark chapter 2. Before we get to that passage, I just want you to be ready, go ahead and open it up. I want to tell you a story I found in uh, one of the books I'm reading. I don't know if any of you have seen it. It's a fascinating book. It's entitled The Other Wes Moore. I don't know if you've seen it. When I, when, I, when I walked by the bookshelf, it just kind of jumped out at me. The Other Wes Moore. It's a story written by Wes Moore, obviously about the other Wes Moore. In there, he tells a story of two kids with the same name, living in the same city, one grew up to be a Rhodes Scholar, a decorated combat veteran, White House fellow, and business leader. The other is serving a life sentence in prison for felony murder. It's a tor- story of two boys, same name, same town, and the journey of their generation. I- I'd like you to listen just briefly to Wes Moore as he kind of gives some background of what he wants to accomplish with this story. Wes Moore. Oh, this is the other Wes Moore. Having a vision for something bigger matters. I know how different my life could have been. And I know that because I know a lot of the cats who I grew up with, their lives are a whole lot closer to Wes's than they are to mine right now. This is not a true crime story. This is not something that's meant to cast some revisionist history about what happened. This is not meant to reopen cases. This is not meant to cast judgment on sentencing. But it's meant to keep people from ending up in Wes's situations ever. One thing I try to be very clear about, I don't want to necessarily tell people what to think. I'm just asking them to think. As you're going through life, think about how your life could go in completely different directions based on the things that you decide today and the things that you decide to do every day and what you decide to make your habits. And that became the motivation behind this whole point. That became the motivation behind this whole project. And this was a very difficult process because it forced me to ask questions that I never asked before. It forced me to dig deeper into my life in a way that I never thought I would ever have to. The chilling truth is that his story could have been mine and the tragedy is that my story could have been his. Had it not been for those folks who helped me understand that, had it not been for those people who ushered me into manhood in the way that they did, things could have been very different. I didn't want it to just be a book that people read, but I wanted it to be a larger call to action. The whole point was to actually have a conversation and to talk about the realities of not just these two boys, but the realities of all of us. There's nothing more important (laughs) than when you think back on your life, the fact that you made your life mean something. Wes's fate is sealed. The question I wanted to ask was why was Wes's fate sealed long before February 7 of 2000? The biggest gap that we have in our society isn't necessarily the education gap or the technology gap, but it's the expectation gap. How do we help people think differently about their lives, and how do we think differently about the lives of others? That is the key hurdle that we've got to get over, because once we get over that, everything else is just details. That is the keyhole. How do we help people think differently about their lives.
I'd like to suggest to you that is really the core theme in Mark chapter 2. Jesus has come as God to this world, and what he wants people to do is think differently about their lives. So do you have your Bibles open? Mark chapter 2. It begins with this story. A few days later, when Jesus was again in Capernaum, the people heard that he had come home. So many people, maybe you're familiar with this story. Maybe some of you, this is the first time you've heard this story. What's so powerful about it is that when people heard that Jesus was in Capernaum, they all gathered around. The story says that it was so crowded that there was no longer any room inside the building. There was no access through any of the doors, any of the windows. And so we have this powerful story of a man who is paralyzed and he's desperate for healing. Out of desperation... The story says they climb up on the roof. They tear the roof apart. I was kind of intrigued this morning. I went around to one of the children's Sabbath school rooms, and they were actually building out of, uh, you know, popsicle sticks. They were building one of these houses, and they were actually reenacting this story. So, boys and girls, I want you to know this story is so real. It's so wonderful because it tells a story of, well, Jesus is trying to get people to think differently about their lives. He knows he's paralyzed. He knows he has a need. What he does not know and what his larger community does not understand is that God is available and that God is willing. God does not need to be convinced. It's the other way around. God is desperately trying to convince us that I am available. And so the ropes are lowered down through the roof. Paralyzed man is there. When Jesus saw the faith, he said to the paralytic, Son, your sins are forgiven. Now here's where the story starts to get a little bit complicated because there are others in the room watching. They did not bring the the paralyzed man. They're, well, as it says right here, they're teachers of the law. Teach of the law were sitting there thinking to themselves, why does this fellow talk like that? He's blaspheming. Who can forgive sins but God alone? Now notice, immediately Jesus knew in his spirit that this is what they were thinking in their hearts. And Jesus says, why are you thinking these things? Jesus poses a question because he wants them to think differently. I'd like to suggest to you that this is one of the core themes here in Mark chapter 2. Jesus wants them to think differently. How's that go with you? Do you like thinking differently? I'm really amazed there's not a single amen. Yeah, the, the truth is that most of us have our patterns of thought. We have figured out how things work for us, and I don't want that to be messed with. That, there we go, there we go. I, and I say it right with you, amen. Once I have my pattern set, I told you last week, I altered my pattern, got into a car wreck. That's how that works. <laughs> Why are you thinking these things? Which is easier than Jesus probes? Which is easier to say to this paralyzed man, your sins are forgiven, or to say, get up and take your mat and walk? But so that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. I need to pause here for just a minute. I'd like you to put your fingers right on that little phrase there in Mark chapter 2. Jesus says, so that you'll know the Son of Man. Church family, this is a pivotal statement that Jesus is making at the beginning of his ministry. The term son of man comes directly from Daniel chapter 7. In the prophecy given to Daniel, it was foretold that the Messiah, the anointed one, would come. The son of man would be present on earth. When Jesus stood in that room, he was boldly declaring, prophecy is being fulfilled today. The son of man has come. Anyone who is connected with Scripture at this point, they're saying, wow. The challenge that they're having right now is that Jesus was coming differently than what they had imagined. Jesus was looking different and he was acting different. But in order to show that he had the power as son of man to do this, he said, I forgive your sins and get up and walk. Jesus 
throughout this entire chapter is casting a vision of doing differently. I mean, if that's not enough for you, just follow the next story. Immediately following this healing story and this dialogue comes the story about Jesus taking a walk out by the lake. It begins in verse 13. Jesus again went out to the seaside. A large crowd followed him and he began to teach. As he walked along, verse 14, as he walked along, he saw Levi sitting at the tax collector booth. Ah, the story now starts to gain a a fascinating momentum. Jesus has already healed a man who is obviously a sinner. That's why he's paralyzed. Jesus has already done that. And now Jesus does something uniquely different. He not only dialogues, if you follow the story, he not only dialogues with Levi. Follow the story. What does Jesus do? He hosts a dinner party. He has a fellowship luncheon, and in some of your versions, if you read it down through, it will show there that Jesus is reclining. Jesus is putting himself in a posture by his entire body presence. He is stating to Levi and his buddies that I am at home with you. I am comfortable with you. Oh, how I want to be like Jesus. Dear God, change my heart so that I would truly be able to say, should I come in company with a paralytic, should I come in company with this tax collector and his buddies, that I would be able to recline with them, to create community with them. Now, in the story, it's absolutely amazing. I want you to come down to verse 16. When the teachers of the law who were, and the Pharisees were, saw him eating with the sinners and the tax collectors, they asked his disciples, why does he eat with the tax collectors and the sinners? You got to pause there. What's fascinating about this particular word in its context, the Pharisees did not use this term sinner as falling short of the glory of God. This particular Greek rendering gives the idea of Social economic challenge. These are the people who had to work common jobs to the point that they were breaking the oral law. I said a lot, and that may not make a lot of sense. So let me back up. These were Jews whose occupations, maybe due to their education, maybe due to their circumstance, had the jobs where they might be touching untouchable stuff. They might be doing jobs that the rest of the church family would say, I would hire you, but I wouldn't eat potluck with you. I would employ you, but I would never go on vacation with you. I would sign a contract with you, but I pray my child would never date your child. Is that kind of making the point? These were church members being judged by other church members as not deserving the reclining presence of anybody, let alone God. But God had made it clear, I will recline, if I can restate it, I will recline with the lowest of the low. That, that's what, exactly what he was doing. I will recline with the lowest of the low. Are, are you kind of getting a pattern of what's going on here in this chapter? Jesus comes as God, and he comes as a change agent. Now the very next story, it comes to this. Mariella read it for us. I won't read the entire thing. It begins at verse 18. Now John's disciples and the Pharisees were fasting. Some people came and asked Jesus, how is it that John's disciples, the disciples of the Pharisees are fasting, but yours are not fasting? Mm, this story, these, these verses are just so ripe with the power of the presence. You see, there were four main 
fast days in the Jewish annual calendar system. Some commentators have suggested that this particular fast had to do with the most significant of them all, the Day of Atonement, when the entire community should be in a spirit of fasting. And as they're looking around, all the different religious groups are doing the respectable, the traditional. They are good, wholesome Jews. And suddenly they look at Jesus, and what are they doing? Oh, could I have some more of that? They're eating. Jesus is confronted. Why aren't, you know, you read it already. Jesus very simply says, I'm present with them. And when I am present with them, they can't act as if I'm gone. I am present and my presence, church, here's, here's where this really confronts us. My presence rewrites your traditions. That's what he really is getting to when he gets into this powerful illustration of new cloth, old cloth, old wineskins, new wineskins. This is perhaps the point where we as Adventists, fundamental Christians, are sometimes challenged with how gracious and how consistently available God is to the brokenness in the world. You see, this is, this is the keyhole. This is the, this is the sleeve that you, you turn it, it starts to unlock everything. I am, Jesus says to the Jewish world of his time, I am going to create a new manner of how you live out the kingdom publicly. What Jesus does in these passages, he deals with not only the forgiveness of sins and healings, he touches one of the core values in the Jewish economy. Jesus starts to, well, fulfill. He starts to fulfill the meaning of Sabbath itself. I have sometimes wondered, haven't you wondered at different times why the gospel writers put different stories together? And, and this is one of those chapters that I, I've really been fascinated with. Why is Mark, as a historian, collecting these stories together? What's his point? Mm. The very next story, after talking about fasting, Mark then gives this story. One Sabbath, Jesus was going through the grain fields. You know this one? And as disciples walked along, they began to pick some heads of grain. The Pharisees said to him, look, why are they doing that which is what, church? Unlawful. The Pharisees have said, you are harvesting. You are gleaning. For a long time, I thought that Jesus referred to David and Abathar simply as illustration. You know, after all, Jesus said, you know, there was a time when David, during the time of Abathar, the high priest, when David went in and, and he ate. I'd like to suggest to you that Jesus is not using this as illustration. He's using it as a common path that Jesus was traveling just as David was traveling. David did this act of going in and taking the bread which only should be given to the priests. David give, gave, did this event before he was publicly recognized as king. It really is more important than maybe what it sounds. God had already claimed David to be king, but he was not publicly recognized as king. Do you see a similarity? Jesus Christ is king, but you know what? Right now, you and I are still waiting for him to be enthroned. Jesus, in his life here, 
and in the life of the church has made unique, powerful claims. In church family, if you haven't noticed it yet, some of his claims are quite disruptive. He did it right then. He went around and he said, it's okay for us to harvest some grains, even though that was against the oral tradition of the church. Have you ever noticed the Adventist church has some oral traditions? Oh, I take it by your chuckle, you do. You know, there, you know, it depends on where you grew up, whether you could wade into the water up to your ankles or up to your knees. But if you threw the ball hard enough, you might actually be fortunate enough to go up to your waist. These are oral traditions, aren't they? These are oral traditions of how we observe the Sabbath day. Jesus ended that whole dialogue out in the field with the grains by saying, the Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. So the Son of Man, oh, he reuses this again. The Son of Man, the fulfiller of prophecy, is the Lord even of the Sabbath day. And if I deem it important to give life on the Sabbath day, that is of preeminent importance. That's what I'm going to do. I am going to give value to the things that are most valuable to me. What I'd like to suggest to you, church, is that Jesus finds people more valuable than time. I'd like to suggest to you that when Jesus hung on the cross, he did not hang on the cross to redeem a sundown to sundown event. Jesus hung on the cross to redeem and to restore people, empowering them so that they might fully appreciate and enjoy what it is to have a rest stop. You see, in the context of this story, there are people in the Jewish church who are held at arm's length. They're not strangers out on the street. They are strangers within the church. And every Sabbath, to some degree, based on where they sit, based on their interaction, they are isolated on a regular basis And God says, I want to recline with these people. Maybe you need a God who's willing to recline with you right now. (laughs) Would you like to have that picture? (laughs) That, That today, right now, at the end of your week, I don't know if any of you are exhausted or not. I don't know if any of you are just kind of fed up. You see, the picture that we find here is that there is a God who is willing, even on the Sabbath day, to go out of the ordinary patterns, the ordinary prescriptions of how it ought to be done in order to recline with you. He would even go so far as to break the oral traditions. That's really what he's doing in this chapter. He is breaking oral traditions to gain access to our presence. I will forgive you. I will walk with you who have been ignored. I will even come to you on the Sabbath day. See, Mark continues the theme on into chapter 3. Chapter 3 continues with the story because soon after all these dialogues are going on, Jesus is in church one day, and he sees a man with a shriveled hand. And the other people in church see the man with a shriveled hand. And it's almost like all of a sudden people are walking around. Now what's he going to do? We've seen him forgive the paralyzed. We've seen him harvest grain on Sabbath. We have seen him eat when the rest of us are fasting. Now what is he going to do? Jesus, knowing what's in their mind, knowing what's in their heart, he heals the man of his crippled hand. Now, church, let's stop and think about this. Is this a life-threatening circumstance? This is one of the Adventist traditions that I believe the gospel of Mark and the person of Jesus are really confronting. 
we have taken it into our tradition that unless it's an emergency, we do not serve. Right? Unless it's an emergency, we don't help. Unless it's life-threatening, we don't move. I just want you to know that I'm not as radical as some of you might consider me to be today. I'd like to claim a little bit of heritage in here. Um, do you remember that this country had a civil war at one time? And we as Adventists, we really like to go back to that chapter in history because it's really fascinating because what do you do as a Seventh-day Adventist when your country is in civil war? Do you serve? How do you serve? What position do you hold? There's a very fascinating short paragraph statement from James White addressing the issue. And it's just opinion. Please understand it's just opinion. But James White, when he saw many Adventists trying to get out, trying to leave, he said, listen, the Union, he was addressing the Union Army, and I'm paraphrasing, but I'll be glad to share the whole context with you. Listen, the Union Army is defending the rights of the downtrodden. James White goes on to say, it's the best army army in the world. It doesn't stop there. We should not use Sabbath as an excuse not to serve. Wow. Wow. We should not use Sabbath as an excuse not to serve. I'd like to bring that line forward just a bit. We should not use the Sabbath as an excuse not to care. A good friend of mine suggested to me very, very recently that perhaps Sabbath is that day that is freest of all the days when we could use our individual unique abilities use them without there being any trappings of doing it for self-advancement, but using some of my greatest core gifts, Sabbath afternoon, to go out and to serve people, to recline with them, to come alongside of them, and to make a difference in their lives. It would be a rest stop. It would be a point where you as a Christian, where we as a Christian body would be able to say, God has given me this rest at the end of the week where I am able to come along to you and say, stop. Stop the hurt in your life. Stop the isolation. I want to be with you. I know I confess, and I do not want anyone to feel awkward. That's not my desire. I know that for some of you, this annual event of Make a Difference Day is out of your personal tradition. And I, 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 I respect that. I don't believe there's an issue of right or wrong. So I pray that you would never feel judged by me, and I pray that I would never be judged by you in using the Sabbath inappropriately. Jesus does break our old wineskin, folks. He really does invite us to look at the world just a little bit differently. He does invite us to engage with our communities in different patterns. He's the creator. He's the liberator. He's the recreator. And sometimes I believe that Jesus is going to invite us to share in those different roles in ways that might just at the beginning point cause us some level of discomfort. There's in your bulletin something. It's not only the insert that says what we're going to do next week. It's open up your bulletin. You'll see that there's the card. It says, thank you for being such great neighbors from the Carmichael Seventh-day Adventist Church. There's a list of different things that are going on at the end of the year here, inviting them to that. I want you to have this in your personal possession. 
Because while this is something that we're going to hand out door to door right around the church facility, I would specifically like to invite you, the congregation, to come in mass next Sabbath. To bring the cookies, to have so many cookies and so many bags that we won't be able to just do our own immediate neighborhood. I'd like you to take some bags of cookies home to your own personal neighborhood. I'd like to invite you to walk around where you live and touch people, get acquainted with them. Do you know that there are some people in worship with us today who have been blessed by a lady who simply went around her neighborhood and gave away cookies? Steps to Christ with it, a promise of prayer and friendship. There are people who are in church here today because someone went door to door with cookies. Wow, how radical is that? Then Jesus asked them, which is lawful on the Sabbath day? To do good or to do evil? To save life or to kill? I pray that you and I would increasingly live lives that reflect the very sound of God walking in the garden with Adam and Eve. While they knew fully and completely that they were broken, while they knew completely that they had done wrong, they heard the sound of God approaching them, coming to be with them. I believe that's one of the great privileges of the Seventh-day Adventist Church today. I believe that's one of the great privileges of the Carmichael Seventh-day Adventist Church, that we get to be the sound of God approaching people today to give life. So next Sabbath, consider this your personal invitation. If you're in the neighborhood, would you come out? Allow maybe the oral traditions of your life to be broadened just a little bit. And please understand that that's not a new concept here. That's actually a concept that Jesus began addressing in his walk with humanity broaden the territory of his kingdom. Dear Jesus, this morning we make a confession that we don't, we don't know you fully as you want to be known and we may not have all the answers but what we desire, Lord, is that we do thoughtfully advance your kingdom. Expand our own hearts, expand our own sensitivities to know how we can engage on a regular basis with a world that, that needs to know there's hope, needs to know that there is a God who loves to recline with humanity. So I pray right now that if there's anybody here that's particularly lonely that Maybe today in worship they would have been reminded that there's a God who would love more than anything else to just to come and spend time with them, to give them rest, to give them a pause. And I also pray that we who have received your pause, we who have received your rest, that we would find it a holy freedom to extend that rest with others. Let your kingdom come and let your will be done. In your name, amen.
Amen. Just a reminder once again, next week is Make a Different Sabbath. Uh, if you'd be willing to come at 10 a.m., it's a little earlier than usual, but we're going to meet here in the sanctuary uh, just to celebrate and pray before going out to serve the community. So feel free to uh, um, only maybe not wear your three-piece suits next week, uh, and we'll look forward to serving together with you. Thank you so much for being here. Um, afterwards, if there's any way you need to meet with Jesus today, uh, we would love to pray with you afterwards here up at the front or on the sides. So we just pray that the, God, the grace and peace of our Lord Jesus Christ would go with you.